the idea was take a group of users sharing a trunk, look who's using the most at any point in time, and if the trunk is full, start whacking them and, and slowing them down. As uh, Jim put it, what did you call that, Jim? Whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole. Sort of, so a new, a new coin term for the product as of this morning is the automatic whack-a-mole project. And, Product and that's and that's kind of what an ed equalizer is. It looks for the moles as they pop up and wax them. Now, the analogy is basically when does a mole, when does a mole pop up? Well, a mole pops up when they're using too much bandwidth and the network is 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 congested. And if you can whack these moles fast enough, you keep your network from overloading, meaning gridlock. Now, gridlock is sort of an insidious thing because it's not just a the, 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 way, the way a network operates with, with web browsers and whatnot is when, when your network peaks and everybody locks up, everybody's trying at the same time. You know, you just hit you refresh on your browser and you're trying to bring up a page. What your browsers do is they keep retrying. So, so it's almost like a traffic jam where, you know, everybody tried to get on the freeway at once and it didn't work and they just keep pushing and butting heads against each other. So the, so the gridlock period is exasperated and lasts for much, much longer. So in, in traffic control, you notice how they have these lights on the freeway where they put a red light so that it just doesn't happen. And so you, don't, you still have traffic on the freeway and it's still pretty full, but you don't have absolute everybody stopped. And that's kind of, that's kind of the, well, that is the exact analogy of a net equalizer. I don't have the math behind it, but, but basically, if you just keep it from getting completely stopped, you can allow a lot more people to flow smoothly instead of nobody. So it's sort of an all or nothing proposition. our behavior-based shaping was, as people were discovering, people were just going, yeah, I plugged it in. It doesn't, yeah, we don't really know what's going on, but it's, it's whacking the moles really good and it's keeping the traffic down. And so it doesn't really matter what the traffic is. It's, it's if you see the behavior-based correlation between bad behavior and bad applications, there's, there's a one-to-one -one matching, meaning somebody that's using a lot of data with peer-to-peer -peer or doing large downloads or large email attachments generally should take a lower priority than somebody that's doing uh, you know, streaming audio, uh, a, a text messaging, uh, just regular web browsing, short emails. Those are the, uh, Citrix is another one that comes up because uh, that's in the business office and everybody says, well, my Citrix is the most important. Well, 99% of the Citrix traffic is really small. So if you give that relative priority over the big traffic, you've solved it. But it's a much, much simpler model. It doesn't take any expertise. It doesn't take ongoing engineering costs, which we, you know, which we pass along to our customers. And so we have a, a big price difference between us and them. came across the net equalizers and uh, we're very happy. We don't have to spend the time to get everything configured and babysit it almost in the day-to-day -day operation. It just kind of sits there and, and does its job. It keeps the connections down and we haven't got the complaints we used to get from students that uh, you know, this game is not working or this application is not working, it's getting misclassified. That's, that's why the idea of you know, behavior-based shaping works is if, if this network becomes really crowded, then you can see that this person has a disproportionate number because all these people are actively doing something, but they're using a very small amount of bandwidth. So if we steal from this guy, in the case of you know, maybe we're getting near that critical thing, that one person suffers a little bit on their download. Who knows what this is? This might be a big email attachment. Um, they might suffer for a few seconds but at the relief of everybody else, hence, hence the traffic jam is, 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 is averted. Hogman at 12,000, that's the number, that's the threshold where any one of those connections we saw will or may or may not be slowed down in a critical situation. So if, if the network is congested, in other words, getting close to, to, to 200 meg, then the next thing the net equalizer looks at is Hogman to say, is this connection a good or bad one? It's just a relative term. And, and, and 12,000 is a magic number because that happens to be where Skype and, and streaming audio um, cut off. So anything below 12,000, that's where Skype and streaming audio and VoIP phones would be usually below that. And anything above that is, is big. And if you just go back from memory from that other screen we looked at, it's sort of like everything's below. You saw a lot of small numbers and then bang, there's one big number. So it's no, it's no accident that we pick 12,000 because 90, 90 plus percent of the traffic is going to be below there. And uh, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the quick traffic. And so, again, rather than, than try to figure out what somebody's doing, in other words, we don't really care what it is. We just know that 
Most things that an administrator would, would allow that aren't a problem would be below that, and everything else would be above that. Now, the reason why I'm saying you can, you can bump that up, and this is sort of a philosophical question, do you think it's appropriate for, you know, with YouTube being so popular now, is that something that you think you can afford to let your students, you know, run with without getting, without getting delayed? Because YouTube is going to run about uh, 300 kilobits a second, and that's, that's going to get caught. And remember, it's only going to get caught when the network's congested. So, this, you know, this, this morning in the dorms, students can probably watch all the YouTube they want, but if, if, if it gets crowded, we're going to cut back on it. And this is sort of the, the latest thing that we're running into with, with consulting with our customers is, you know, YouTube has become a reasonably acceptable form of, of communication. It's not like peer-to-peer -peer where it's all generally bad copyrighted material. So we're sort of between a rock and a hard place in that you've got to have enough bandwidth to support it. Now, the interesting thing with 200 megabits is that if you raise this to 36,000, the YouTube will probably get through. And guess what? There's still a lot of other big stuff out there that's probably causing you know, big peer-to-peer -peer downloads, large email attachments, large picture attachments. They're going to take you know, a, a T1's worth of bandwidth when, 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 they, when they fire up. So you can still get some, some shaping, shaping in there. Uh, you might have enough bandwidth to do video at 200 megs in your dorms and raise that, but keep an eye on it. Nobody serves up you know, these peer-to-peer -peer files with any speed. They're, they all go desperately slow. So what they do, if, I, if you're downloading you know, a Led Zeppelin or the latest bootleg movie or whatever, if it's a popular one, there'll probably be 10,000 sites with it on, you know, available. And so what your client does is it goes out and tries to download simultaneously from all, as many sites as it can connect to. <laughs> and that way, the reason being is that way it gets the file sooner because otherwise it might take, it might take you know, 12 hours. I mean, these, some of these connections are barely even dribbling data, and these are you know, 10 meg files. But if you get 100 barely dribbling connections, it goes quickly. So what we used to see, and as of last year, you know, I would, you know, some new ISP or residence hall would put an equalizer in. They wouldn't really have started it up. We would go here, and we'd see 100, 100, 150. We'd see half a dozen. And that was accounting for maybe 50% of their bandwidth on their network you know, all day long and night. So, um, and I just did one the other day where um, I, had, I had a customer that they had a hard limit on, a, on an IP address. They said, this person's downloaded 30 gig, and I have your hard limit on it, meaning our, our thing is supposed to limit them to 500 and, or 64 kilobits. I don't know what they had, and it wasn't working. And, and, and they said, everything else is working, but this one hard limit, you know, your, your, your box is broken. You know, it's just, it's just not working. So I logged in, <laughs> I, did a, I did a count, and the IP address they were trying to hard limit had 150 connections. And I, and, I, and I explained, I said, well, the hard limit isn't sophisticated enough to track. We could, I, I said, there, there's ways we could, we, could, we could stop 150 connections cold, but if we, if we, if we divine, designed our algorithm like that, we'd have a lot of other bad effects. We'd have to do a lot of packet dropping. So we try to, we try to when we, we'll get to that in a second, but when, when the net equalizer try, tries to limit, if you just put a fixed rate cap on an IP address, we've, we're trying to maximize smoothness without, without adding a huge cost to the hardware because it takes a lot of overhead to sort of, you know, think ahead and figure out how fast do we need to buffer these packets. So we, we got a nice algorithm in there, but what broke it was 150 simultaneous connections trying to keep track of, and so they were still, you know, blasting through our, our, um, our hard limit and getting more data than they wanted. But if the customer had put a connection limit on, which is what, if you read through our, our start guide, we recommend both, you know, putting a, a generic connection limit so nobody has an outrageous number of connections. And to date, the only thing that'll take, you can see out of, you know, only 10 connections, there's only a handful of users out there, and you've got how many thousand people in the dorms. So the only, no, the only things that take maybe more than 10 connections and sustain it are viruses and peer-to-peer -peer that I've ever seen. So.